So hello and welcome to the Jefferson Educational Society's Digital Programming. I'm Ben Spagan and I'm the Vice President at the Jefferson. Hi, I'm Angela Beaumont and I'm the Director of Operations at the Jefferson. And I'm Sean Fedorko. I run things here at Radius Cowork. So Sean is um, joining us today in the conversation, um, co-working communities of professional and personal interest. And uh, he is the co-founder of Radius Cowork, a co-working space in Erie, where he provides freelancers, remote workers, and small businesses the facilities, programming, and inspirational community they need to grow and succeed. He's also co-chairing the Young Erie Professionals Entrepreneurship Committee. He's on the Erie Downtown Partnership Economic Vitality Committee and serves on the Erie Regional Chamber and Growth Partnerships Government Affairs Committee. His background is in public policy, political science, and philosophy. And as Angela mentioned, today we are discussing co-working, uh, communities of professional and personal interest. Uh, co-working has become a popular subject of discussion with the rise of the freelance economy, remote work, entrepreneurship, and as people seek new ways to feel connected to one another. Uh, to unpack that and Erie's uh, entrepreneurial ecosystem and Radius co-work role in that, uh, as well as how the COVID-19 pandemic is affecting changes in co-working communities and the industry, we'll discuss that with Sean uh, with his firsthand experience, his research, and his observations. So since this program is first airing live on the Jefferson Facebook page, we'll work our way through as many questions from you, the viewers, as we can as, as we host this event. If you have any questions, just leave it in below in the comment section. If you're watching a later broadcast of this event, please feel free to send us questions and we'll get them along to Sean as best as we can. And of course, for more information about upcoming Jefferson Educational Society programs and publications, please do visit www.jeserie.org and be sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Mr. Sean Fedorko, thank you for joining us for this conversation today. Thank you for having me. So for those of you not familiar, Radius Cowork is a co-working space on the ninth floor of the Renaissance Center, the city the city's tallest building, which has benefited from renters <laughs> like you. Sean, the Jefferson has taken the Leadership Academy several years in a row to Radius Cowork for use of your conference rooms for a lecture. Frankly, I love the cool atmosphere and the great view. And I feel also there's a great vibe in your office. So imagine hip new office furniture and state-of-the-art tech, local art, great small batches of roasted coffee, and combine that with the idea of meeting interesting young professionals. So that's the environment that you would meet there. So just perfect for what Radius Cowork stands for, providing office space for startups, looking for inspiration and cross-pollination, and for individuals seeking to get a foothold in the local industry. Sean, why Radius? both the name and why do this of all the things you could be doing. Yeah, the, the name is actually pretty easy. Um, you know, it was my um, uh, uh, co-founder who helped me build everything for years. Bill Scholz and I were going back and forth on the name and we thought, well, we want to be in the center of everything, right? And so we were thinking of names related to that and Radius really kind of struck us as, as kind of the coolest. We're in the tallest building in the center of downtown, in the center of the city. And from here, you go out in any direction to get to anything else you would need in here. Uh, as for myself, why do I do it? Um, you know, I had worked in a co-working space in Washington, D.C. before I came here. And when I uh, came to Erie uh, on a short contract, I thought I would just work in a co-working space. And there wasn't one. And I really missed being around those people. Um, I wanted to work with other people who had great ideas. I was otherwise going to work alone. And so went looking for other people who uh, wanted the same thing. And uh, we found a place and we, we brought everyone together and we accepted new people and we've never stopped. It just kept growing. And after a while, I realized, you know, this is actually what I love doing. And so made it my, uh, my full-time work. Well, sounds to me like a very cool profession. Thank you very much. Um, Radius Cowork has been operating since 2015. Since then, other co-working spaces in Erie have also launched. 
before coming to the US, I had not seen anything like it before, but I remember some of the early, very useful, but now extinguished internet cafes in big European cities before the internet access was available at home. Can you tell our audience a bit more about the concept and history of co-working spaces? And let me guess, it happened first in California where someone got tired of working alone in a garage. Yeah, pretty close. It happened in a lot of places kind of simultaneously, but you're right. Um, the first kind of recorded space that we recognize is called Seabase uh, in Berlin. It was a hacker space in 19... Uh, 95. And the idea was, you know, come to an internet cafe for people who couldn't get internet at home because it was still hard to access at the time. Um, but then kind of all over the split, all over the place, uh, we get this new opportunity. Um, for the first time, cell phones allowed us to travel. Uh, mobile computers allowed us to travel with our work and documentation. Um, the internet uh, being made available all over the place made it easy for us to connect to peers that we had to do work with. And uh, a lot of people who had spent a lot of time working alone, in fact, a rising um, solo workforce, uh, started to come together and solve a problem that they were all discovering. It was lonely to work alone. Um, and it was advantageous to work with other skilled people, especially those who uh, maybe were in radically different uh, careers and professions, but who knew all kinds of things that, that would inspire or change your thinking about your, your own work. Um, and, and we see this happening in, in cities all over the place, and it, it really comes together under a movement that, that gets the name co-working, um, which is its most fundamental uh, aspect, not a, a, a type of real estate solution, but a type of interpersonal solution. We get to work with others, which is what people are really thirsty for. Well, and Thank Sean, one, one of the things that you talk about is that mutually beneficial cooperation and that that's so much more valuable than the antagonistic competition. And I think that, you know, we think of one thing being yesterday, businesses have to compete against each other in order to survive rather than work together to really thrive uh, collectively. One of the interesting things about Radius is the types of members that you serve and the variety of industries that are represented there. Can you give our viewers a, a sense of uh, soup to nuts? Who's at Radius? What does that look like if we're looking at the total picture of your members? And also tell us a little bit about that growth of where you started and where you are now. Yeah, so when we opened uh, in 2015, we had 12 people who kind of agreed to hang out together. We went to cafes, we went to dinner, we worked together, and we're like, yeah, yeah, we'd like to you know, find an office together. We found our, our, our tribe and then we went looking for a home. Um, so we went from 12 to now, uh, you know, 150 <laughs> as of the beginning of the year. Uh, so, you know, 10, more than 10 times in growth in, in five years in that membership. And that's, you know, not even counting the 150 more who had been here at some stage in their professional development or their business and have since you know, got graduated out and have become alumni. Um, so we've seen about 300 people kind of be members in some capacity in that time. Um, we're kind of unique among co-working spaces. We're the only co-working space of our kind in Erie. Uh, others we've, we've uh, encouraged and helped get started uh, have specializations. So Thrive Therapy Space, they really focus on a HIPAA compliant space for therapists um, and other kind of mental health professionals. Um, the Bastion, which is a, a really unique space, they focus on serving the needs of metal workers, woodworkers, clay workers, oil painters. Um, you know, the, the makers and musicians who create physical assets and then want to exhibit them and sell. We're the only space that focuses on uh, kind of a professional office environment. And uh, we have a, a really great demographic. It's almost a perfect bell curve and kind of the, the youngest just coming out of college and, you know, retirees who are now kind of mentors, consultants, or starting a business kind of later in life uh, in order to do more and new interesting things. But the majority are kind of that, you know, mid 20s to mid 30s, getting started and growing a, growing a business. Uh, and we're actually pretty unique in that. I think a little bit more than 50% of our membership are women, which, which is not typically common. Um, as for the businesses, you know, we've got a lot of tech. Tech just lends itself to a, a flexible workspace because you can drop down with a laptop and, and get going. Um, and because we host servers and have really high bandwidth. So you know, it's really easy to work in tech and work here, especially marketing tech. Uh, but we've got people who work in banking, people who work in real estate development. We've got people who are business consultants, um, some who work in manufacturing, manufacturing technology. Uh, we've got some people who are in economic development, some who work in nonprofits, some who are just freelance graphic designers, and others who are managing a team of 15 professionals and 2 million in revenue a year. 
Um, so we've got, we've got a lot of pretty interesting uh, people who make this their home because they all share something in common, which is, you know, a thirst for one another. So a, a follow up on that, Sean, because, uh, you know, you, you mentioned the core demographic. And I, I think when people, if they haven't had the co-working experience, they do picture uh, younger people gathering around that. But you did mention you've got retirees or people that are on a second or third or fourth or 17th career that, you know, they're interested in relaunching and doing something new. And so being able to welcome in somebody that, you know, maybe we don't have the perception of a 60 year old walking into a co-working space. Uh, what's that like, that intergenerational mix in terms of having somebody straight out of college and then somebody who's been at work for potentially 30, 40 years? Well, I think part of what's really cool is you, you might expect maybe some friction, right? That might be the, the assumption, but there's really not because people self-select into this community. They're motivated to be here. They want to be around one another. And what's so some cool interactions, right? I've seen a guy who did 10 years at Goldman Sachs come out, he and his family just moved to Southern Africa, uh, where he gets involved in the development of uh, metal mines. So he is back in Erie, while he and his wife are having their third child, still managing the development of mining operations in Zimbabwe, sitting across from a 22-year-old Gannon graduate who right out of school decides he's going to start a business. And these two guys chat, you know, they have things to teach one another. Um, they enjoy one another. And so, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's not really a, a, ever a, a point of friction as much as it's typically an opportunity for people to, um, you know, learn what they don't expect they want to know. And so with that, Sean, you're talking about that, that bump ability and that, uh, you know, uh, the ability for, you know, a 22 year old to sit down and talk to somebody who's much more seasoned and have that conversation in a real life space. Uh, we'd normally be having our conversation in a real live space at the Jefferson, uh, but here we are, you know, amidst a pandemic, COVID-19 has, has hit us hard uh, and it's forced us all into a, a different style of working. Uh, the pandemic has put a temporary hold, we don't know how long on, on co-working, um, you know, because now we are all working from home. I'm sure that the missing, in some ways, you know, that many are missing that inspiration, that advice, that uh, quietness away from family obligations to plug in in a space and, and put headphones on at work and just not be at home. Uh, what is the alternative in, until we can get back to pre-pandemic order or, you know, a post-pandemic order where, when folks can get back into the space? Give us a sense of how Radius uh, is adapting and what you're seeing from other co-working spaces. Uh, how are you still able to offer services uh, when we cannot get together and have that physical bump ability? Sure. It's, you know, it's a, it's a great question. I think a lot of people would ask that because they think of a, a co-working community as a co-working space. But space is only one component of what we do. We're the community first. And a co-working community typically comes together because we have, you know, we have, we have problems ourselves, we have collective problems, and we'd like to employ collective solutions, which are much more efficient and more gratifying. Well, the most common is a space. We all physically exist. So we all have, let's physically exist in the same space. You know, we're all uh, alone and we'd rather not be alone. So, you know, let's find ways to be together in, in a space. But there's so many other things that we're doing. Um, and we've transitioned anything we did in this space to really the, that digital world. It's figuring out how to uh, prevent one another from being alone, from not being able to solve a problem, being able to tap a network. Uh, the number of times we've seen you know, conversations flare up in our Slack, our, our online chat platform for people trying to solve problems has been awesome. You know, one guy's leaving town for three months uh, and needs someone to watch us up. Found that person in, you know, 20 minutes by tapping the network. So it's as much about, you know, improving the quality of our lives and, and uh, our lived experience as it is our business. But to aid our members in that business work, we've moved our business mastermind groups that we set up and, and run online. We've moved our daily check-ins where we would meet in the morning, have coffee and talk about daily commitments. We've moved that online and created it on a, a Slack channel for it. Um, you know, we do uh, lunch and learns where we sort of teach, have trainings. We've moved those webinars to online webinars like this. Uh, we have uh, virtual happy hours. So, you know, once or twice or three times a week, we'll just throw up a, a chat and 20 people will jump in and have a drink and see how everyone's doing because, you know, maybe you don't have a business problem you need to solve, but you're just lonely. You work alone all day. And then we have workshops. You, you, if you do have a, a, a problem, then, hey, whoever's trying to work on something or if you just got some free time and want to chat and contribute to a solution, 
jump on at noon on Wednesdays and we're going to be workshopping problems. Um, so we've been able to, to keep people really connected, but coworking hasn't really figured out exactly how to do this yet because we did really lean on our space. Serendipity is easier when I bump into you. Um, so discovering the new ways that that's gonna happen in much more creative ways than just lighting up a new Zoom, I think is what coworking communities are, are, are figuring out right now. And that's not just me, that's our members discovering ways to meet their shared needs, especially the new needs that they've never had to, to address before, the new challenges they've never had to address before. They're solving those together and we're just a facilitator in many cases. Well, yeah, and I assume or I think that networks like you are um, that grow around um, Radius Cowork are actually more crisis resistant than individuals. Um, that's just one of the positive outcomes that you see right now that if you have a network, then you're, you're better off in this situation than alone. So yeah, we heard a lot about people and the facility. I have a question here. Um, so I, I as, assume I'm a, I'm a member and I've completed my initial steps in creating a business. I have an idea, my concept stands. Uh, maybe I even uh, did my homework and wrote a business plan. Um, most small businesses have a hard time getting over this hump, uh, this first stage and turn it into a, a viable business, into a stable organization. Um, what do you think is, is beneficial in, in joining this network? What kind of advice, training can this network offer? Can you offer? Um, what's your role in this? Are you more like the matchmaker or do you enjoy the organic growth and the organic um, way things work? Um, please explain a little bit sure. here. Yeah, so it's important to understand that, you know, we're not a business service center. So while we do organize webinars and trainings and workshops, I use those workshops to solve my own problems, you know, running the operation here. And you know, I get feedback from the members as much as I give that feedback. We're not really here to help review and rewrite your business plan for you. We, as far as, as me, Radius, the, the employees, um, what we're doing is discovering what our members' needs are uh, and, and helping kind of collectively answer them. So if our members need to consult with a lawyer, well, if you're out there alone, you can't just call a lawyer and say, I want two and a half hours of your free time and I want you to buy me lunch. It doesn't usually work that way. What we can do is tap one of the lawyers who's in our network, say we've got 20 people who want to ask questions about structuring their own incorporation of their business, either because they're about to do it or they did it and they think they did it wrong. They might be able to optimize it for tax reasons. We bring that lawyer in. He caters lunch. We got 20 people who talk to him. Well, now that, that asset in our network found 10 clients out of that because he's going to be able to help them. Our members got information, but much more important is that the network, network developed knowledge. We don't have to host that seminar after we've done it two or three times because now so many members within the coworking community have that knowledge that if somebody had a new question, they go to somebody that already knows. And that's really what we're trying to, to create is a you know, taking Erie, which five years ago was a very nascent entrepreneurial ecosystem, really had not you know, cultivated the kinds of entrepreneurial tools and knowledge it needed to really thrive. And, and is still, frankly, developing that. You know, we don't have like a robust Series A funding mechanism in place for venture capitalists, but we're building. And so now we don't really teach the classes on incorporation because our members know we'll just point to the people who can explain it to them. So that's really our mission, is to build up a robust knowledge of network, skills, and most importantly, experiences that people can communicate, uh, both as knowledge, um, but also as commiseration. And if it saves me uh, from a, a day of heartache and maybe deciding that this isn't the path for me, because somebody comes over and says, I was there six months ago, I know you just lost your biggest client, let me tell you how I got my, biggest, my next biggest client, because we're gonna do that for you. Um, or it's somebody who comes over and saves me 20 hours of Googling by saying, oh, you want to solve your payment processing problem this way. I ran into that last year. So it's a lot of what we're trying to cultivate. Uh, we grow the community, grow the knowledge, grow the experiences, and thus grow how valuable people can be to one another. And the day that I can just walk away and the network is just exchanging knowledge and problem solving on its own, that's really success. Well, sounds like some of the larger corporations should be envious. And um, I was just thinking of uh, 
a few classes that I took myself in college where we were like thrown into a situation. Now you have to teach each other the peer teaching. And that was really hard in the beginning, but it actually was much more fun. And I, I feel like we got smarter at the end. So nothing, you know, don't want to diminish the work of a teacher, <laughs> but um, it has some advantages um, to, to do the peer training and peer uh, consulting. Thank you. Um, Sean, you were recently asked in a local uh, video production uh, done by one of the uh, businesses here in Erie, how you are adapting to the COVID-19 crisis. I watched the video, I thought it was very good. Um, and it was very candid and moving in, in parts. Um, gave me an insight into how Erie businesses and residents are adapting to these trying circumstances. Um, how would you rate your current client state or your organization state now that the first shock waves have subsided? Um, what remedies do you suggest to people and what can be done to keep this communal approach um, to work intact? Yeah, so as far as the shock to our members, you know, uh, it, it was pretty spread out. You know, some of our members went down to zero revenue. Um, some, you know, maybe lost a little bit, maybe recovered a little bit, maintained kind of a, a, a steady income and, and operations just got maybe a little more difficult because they had to go and work from home. Um, some of our members are booming you know, just so happens that they're in an industry that's in demand under these circumstances. So we've, we've kind of seen that spread, but for everybody, it's been challenging. You know, there, there were uh, resources or processes or predictable tools, um, even uh, 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 habits of how we conduct business that we no longer can, can really rely on. And uh, I think there was a, initially a period of, uh, well, we weren't really sure how long it would last. And so people just put the brakes on for a moment and reassessed what was going on then they tried to build new traction. So a lot of our companies got uh, into figuring out new services. You, um, uh, Hannah Kirby at Ember and Forge is a member, got into delivering coffee to your doorstep, worked with another of our members, um, Jeff McCuller and, and Erie Aleworks to package their coffee and beer, right? Two things that people, you know, can't, you can't go to the cafe anymore, you can't go to the bar, how can you get both at once? Um, some of our members, you know, went down to zero employment and another local business, the one that supplies our coffee, Happy Mug, well, everybody's buying coffee to be delivered at home now. So we were taking people who had lost kind of their opportunity to run their business full time or staff who had lost positions and getting them connected with companies that were booming so that they could pick up hours and help those companies fill, uh, fill their labor needs. So there was a lot of adaptation. And some of our companies out of this, like Radius, have built new tools that they're going to use go going forward. You know, this was a, an area of expertise they hadn't developed because they were busy with what was immediately um, you know, an immediate need under the previous environment. Um, and now that we've gotten these skills, like Radius has built the skills of connecting all of our members remotely. Um, Hannah's figured out how to build a walk-up coffee window, which was always on our to-do list, but hadn't gotten done. Um, you know, the breweries have figured out how do we deliver beer to people, uh, which is, you know, in really high demand when it keeps selling our product. I think we'll re retain a lot of those skills. So we've really upskilled um, a big portion of our, our membership. And those who went down to zero, uh, maybe revenue or, or business work, well, they, they don't just sit around on their hands. I mean, these are people who are predisposed to develop new skills, take risks, explore opportunities. Um, and, you know, Menagerie's been out there pumping out videos, little promotional videos for other small eerie businesses, honing their craft and skills in a downtime. So I think we've, we've got some pretty awesome examples of the tenaciousness of a group of young scrappy entrepreneurs in a very, I mean, a very difficult business environment, the city of Erie, compared to, you know, more robust entrepreneurial communities. I, I think that is a, a evidence of how likely it is that our community will bounce back. And I don't just mean the, the co-working community, but the, the broader Erie community. Um, so I, I think that answers most of your questions. Did I miss anything there, Angela? Um, maybe, you know, we all heard about the, you know, administration or the, the um, programs, the payment protection programs, sure. small business uh, bridge loans. Uh, is there anything that you see like helpful that would like these startups uh, uh, would help them, you know, getting through this? So or I think it would be pretty difficult to start something new under this environment and access resources, because most of the resources are going to preserving the businesses that are at risk. But those businesses which were new, were up and running, um, they have been able to access resources. 
some of those are more or less helpful. So the PPP is an example. Um, a couple dozen of our members have uh, sought and acquired uh, the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program assistance. But for a brand new or small business, payroll is minuscule, right? You're scraping by on nickels, you're reinvesting every dollar back into the business. So a program calculated based on revenue expenses or uh, payroll expenses may not be the most helpful for a young startup. There are some CDFIs that have been helpful. So Bridgeway Capital has helped a couple of our members really substantially mm -hmm. um, in, in changing the structure of their loans. Um, and then some local programs, you know, the, the downtown partnership is an example. They've got a program right now helping some of the downtown businesses develop online e-commerce solutions. And some of our members are the companies getting hired to build those e-commerce solutions. So there are some programs that are available. The economic development or finance, financing institutions that do exist have been providing a lot of help. Um, but you know, some of those aren't a great fit for the startup community. Most of the, the preservation efforts are focused on retaining large employers, which have high sales tax uh, and high uh, income tax due to large and well-compensated labor forces. Sean, I think you, you, you unpacked a lot of this in, in Angela's question, uh, but we do have a couple of different audience questions I wanna to toss sure. in here uh, before we get to some quick stuff. Uh, crystal ball question for you, Sean, uh, 12 to 18 months, uh, what does the co-working community look like then? Yeah, there's a lot of conversation, and I'm talking to a lot of other owners about this. We think the co-working communities are going to boom. So a lot of people have lost their jobs. You know, we're at about 20% unemployment. Um, that's ref reflected locally um, as well as kind of nationally. And a lot of those people didn't lose their jobs because they were unskilled or poor performers, but, you know, because of a, a, an enormous global pandemic that disrupted economies, which means they're extraordinarily skilled but their business or their industry may not bounce back soon. They're gonna go looking for work. Some of those who were business owners themselves, they're gonna start something new. They're not just gonna sit around and do nothing for a couple of years. So 12 to 18 months out in the co-working industry, we expect a lot of people to show up as new freelancers, new remote workers, and new small businesses. And the remote workers is a big one that everyone can empathize with because the entire world just got a crash course in how to be a remote employee how to be a remote company managing remote employees. The first time everyone in Erie has learned how to be a remote worker and if they're really kind of predisposed to it, well, that means that our local labor force can, for the first time, go consider remote jobs, which may compensate better than some of their local options based on their skill set and the fit. Some of our local employers have the opportunity now, based on their uh, management skills having improved to manage remote workers to look for maybe some specialized talent internationally or nationally. So I, I think we're going to see a lot of those people who enter the remote workforce not want to work alone at home, but want to enter a co-working community where they do have peers that they can exchange knowledge and skills with all day and even, you know, camaraderie. And, and another question coming in from the audience, and I think this is, you know, perhaps for people that haven't experienced Radius, uh, you know, and, and uh, haven't yet been to your space and, and knows what, know what that looks like, if they do have a sense of what co-working is, uh, it, it might be because they've heard of WeWork. And so the question from the audience is, um, how does the Radius co-work business compare to the shrinking WeWork business? Because there's been some seismic shifts in terms yeah. of WeWork uh, within the past couple of months. So how do you compare, Sean? It's a great question. So when people ask me about WeWork, I always say, you know, does uh, Jekyll and Hyde care what McDonald's does? They both serve food, right? The word co-working has grown so broad. It's kind of like saying the word restaurant. It doesn't tell you anything about the price, the quality of the food, the decor. Is it a franchise? Is it locally owned? Um, so a place like, co or, uh, like Radius is a locally owned, a co-working community that designs everything it does around its the city that hosts it and around what its members need. WeWork is a large corporate co-working space. It's kind of like an olive garden. You know, they solve a, a massive problem of typically scarcity real estate. So you go to downtown Manhattan, if you're a freelancer, it's, it's not possible to rent an office, right? So how do you aggregate all of that need into one uh, affordable office space? Well, that's what a WeWork does. They, they solve a real estate problem. We don't really do that here. We solve a, a loneliness problem, a community problem. Um, and it's, it's, it's analogous to, to you know, uh, uh, Jekyll and Hyde not offering their incredibly delicious spicy chicken sandwich anymore. You know, and I hope it comes back to the menu if anybody's listening and has control over that. Um, you know, I can go in there and I can say, hey, I love the spicy chicken sandwich. Could you get it back on the menu? And if enough of us ask, they, they bring it back. 
Um, but, you know, if I go into a McDonald's and say, hey, you know, uh, I think you should have curly fries instead, they're not going to listen to me, right? So they're, they're very different industries that react very different ways to changes on the ground in a particular community. Thanks for that, Sean. Thanks for the audience questions. Uh, folks, keep them coming. If you're watching the live broadcast here on uh, the Jefferson's Facebook page, uh, you can leave those questions in the comments section. We'll work our way through them. Uh, if you are watching a later broadcast of this on our YouTube channel or on our website, uh, jesery.org, uh, do send the Jefferson questions along. We'll do our best to get them to Sean and get those answered after the program. Uh, quick round of questions, Sean, just some things on the top of your head. Uh, you've talked a lot about, you know, companies and how they've grown and, and what's going on in investment in Erie. Uh, if you had $1 million, where would you invest it? Yeah, it, so if, I'd say it a couple of ways. If I was Radius and Radius got a million dollars, we only need like not even $100,000. We could finish outfitting the floor, you know, get all the facilities we need based on the demand for co-working space in Erie. So, you know, some of that would go to, to Radius as it's been just improving and refining its operations. But we want to do things that our, our members have like a really in, a strong interest in. One of those has been, well, we'd love to open a cafe, right? If we had a million dollars, we'd open a cafe that became kind of a gateway, bringing people out of their homes, connecting them in a community. And then if they really have a, a more sophisticated need, you bring them into the, the co-working space, but giving our members that kind of shared uh, public space to meet people. And the other is a, a vision a bunch of us have had for Radius Gear. So we would love to build a makerspace where members could work on their vehicles, on their motorcycles, could work on, you know, welding projects, cool, like big machine work that you know, we're obviously not going to do on the ninth floor of the Renaissance Center. Now, if I had a million dollars, I would probably be investing it uh, into the development of really uh, competitive space in, in Erie. And what I mean is uh, our commercial environment ecosystem has really not reached the level of demand. So there's, there is no existing class A office space in Erie. There's only one you know, downtown cafe. Um, I think there are a lot of facilities that could be built, incredible theaters that could be built, public spaces, but also professional offices that we haven't yet invested in in the heart of our city, but we're seeing the hints of it, right? EDDC is developing, Erie Insurance is expanding its campus, the b baseball park is getting renovated, the, uh, Civic Center is getting expanded and re renovated. The downtown kind of innovation district is coming together. I want to get on the ground floor of that because I think Erie's bouncing back. Um, you know, and if I just had a million dollars to go do anything anywhere in America, oh my gosh, I, I, would, I would be leveraging that million dollars cash into some borrowed money and I would be picking up a business where the owners are really ready for retirement in this really bad business environment you know, it might not be good for them right now. They don't, they don't want to stick through, you know, until they recover. I'd be looking for a business where the owners are ready to get out. I'd be saying, all right, I'm going to apply my trade and turn this thing around. Um, yeah, I, I wouldn't want to start from zero. I'd want to find something that already had a lot of momentum and I can jump in the cab and hit on the gas again. Awesome. Angela, your quick question for Sean. Yeah, my quick question. Um, Sean, do you know the hedgehog dilemma, also called the porcupine dilemma? Oh, and yeah, absolutely. sometimes happen at Radius Cowork. Yeah, so uh, the hedgehog's dilemma is you know, when we want to get close to one another um, uh, for warmth or comfort, we, we injure each other with our, our quills, right? And what that's a metaphor for is vulnerability. So when we want to seek closeness with people, you know, we, we, it means we have to become more vulnerable. You know, that, that's what closeness is. It's, it's a, it's a two-way street. That's what builds trust. And, you know, some people might initially be wary of entering a co-working environment. Some people who are encountering it for the first time ask, well, how do I protect my intellectual property? Like, well, are you trying to steal an actual property? No, no, I'm not trying to steal. Well, no one's trying to steal it from you, man. Like, you know, if you think someone's, I always tell people this, if you think someone's going to steal your great idea, offer them your second best idea. No one takes it. Everybody's working on their own best idea. So once we come to understand these things about how, you know, what our motivations are, how we can trust people, how we're actually building a cooperation, you know, that's where people start to let their guards down. They become vulnerable. They start exchanging you know, candid information. And it turns out that that's how we get the best help. Because when people really understand the ways that we, we might be experiencing need, they understand the best ways that, that they can aid us. Um, and so that's, that's what we, we'll typically find once people join is after a few weeks, after a couple of months, they realize these are people who like, actually like you. They came here to spend time with you. Um, and they're, they become, you know, people you, you rely on, um, not so much people you're wary of. And people who don't trust, you know, they can't build trust, they, they typically self-select out. 
You mentioned the cafe earlier and you've been hosting uh, virtual happy hours. Any chance you're gonna open your own bar in Erie? So Ben, when you, you know, when you first kind of floated that question at me, you know, we were kicking ideas around, we were talking about this uh, talk coming up. I, I had never thought of that. And I have thought about it a lot since like, yeah, I would like to open a bar. So, uh, you know, we always say, uh, you know, whenever we try to decide what to do, we say, ask the members. Like, I'm not good at predicting what 150 people need. Um, but I know well, it may look that way, but uh, I am good at asking 150 people what they need and want, and then going out and figuring out how to, how to meet that demand. Um, and so, you know, I, I might be floating the question to the members uh, here, if we are radius open to bar, would you want that to be like our official bar? Um, but you know, it's it's nothing I'm going to do in the in the near future. And I'm really appreciative that we've got a couple members who run great bars. Um, Rebecca Stein runs Room 33, just right down the block. Uh, Jeff McCuller, you know, runs Erie Ale Works. And uh, of course, it, I don't I don't think Radius uh, Radius would be Radius without Jekyll and Hyde and, and Cloud Nine that our members run down to all the time. Sean, can we bet on that the next exciting Erie startup has been working at We Use Cowork? Oh yeah, yeah. There, uh, you know, of course we know a lot about what's going on with our members' businesses. Um, there are businesses right now working on uh, renovating buildings, which are going to be prominent downtown. Um, you know, those aren't are finished or open yet. You, you're not seeing any work on the outside yet. But um, you know, businesses within within Radius have grown from kind of two founders to 35 people. Um, they've gotten millions of dollars in, of investment. They might not be names you're hearing right now, uh, but you will increasingly. Sean, uh, in the intro, we went through a lot of things you do and you're involved in and you're plugged in uh, across the scene. Uh, favorite thing to do right now uh, after a long day of interact, interacting, organizing, uh, motivating, coaching, uh, connecting, what do you do to unwind? Um, you know, I, I've really been enjoying the last few days of sun and grilling. Um, I think we're in the gr a great grilling revolution. You know, we can't go out and get hamburgers. Um, it took me six weeks to realize I hadn't had a hamburger, uh, and I got one, and I felt like it changed my life. And so I've, I've realized I need grilling. So I've been doing a lot of cooking of meats out on my deck in the sun. It's been fantastic. Sounds very good. Very good for your health, you know, less fast food. Um, I mentioned earlier the great view that you have from the ninth floor of Radius Cowork. Um, and I know the view from the conference room, which is awesome. It shows uh, the south side of the building where you see some uh, unusual uh, old side buildings or sides of walls where you can still see some, some uh, commercials from, from way back then. But can we also see the lake from your office? Oh yeah, you know, we, uh, we're the entire ninth floor, 10,000 square feet, uh, the Renaissance Center, and we've got windows that look out on the lake and we've got binoculars around some of them. So you can, you know, look out and watch the Niagara sail around. Excellent. So Sean, we are close on out of time here and we just have a couple of questions. So let's uh, <clears throat> pull back from the fast structure here. Um, and I'd be remiss if we didn't return to COVID-19 because that's the moment we're in right now. Uh, when Angela was planning this program uh, a while back, you know, we anticipated being in the Jefferson. Uh, yeah. We weren't thinking that we'd be as disrupted uh, as we are. Um, we're working our way through. Uh, we don't know how or when yet. I think that's, you know, what makes this particularly terrifying for a lot of us. Uh, I can imagine that it's terrifying for those startups that had just launched and, and the, you know, folks that had, you know, maybe right at the end of 2019 or right at the beginning of 2020 said, it's finally time I'm going to launch my own business. And now here we are uh, in a pandemic. Uh, from your observation, experience, and knowledge, what kind of uh, advice, recommendations would you give to folks looking to come through this or at least uh, be able to weather the storm while we're in it? Uh, what advice do you give to those startups? Um, you know, the, the big piece of advice I would give is to reach out to the, the business networks that you do have, even people you maybe never spoke to before. You know, if you do see a business that, that has been figuring out a way to push forward and you're maybe struggling, go talk to them. Like, we're more than happy to help. I would, I would love to talk to businesses and business owners that I haven't met yet. Um, because the, the, there are resources, right? That, you know, there are federal funding programs that have been released and, and you know, are coming down the pipeline. But this, you know, money is not going to be the only solution. A lot of it's going to be ingenuity. 
So if you can get tapped into the professional resources that are going to help you, the peers who are going to help you, and you stick to the idea, right? You know, uh, business owners get into this not because it's going to be easy, but because it's going to be hard. And that difficulty makes the problem purposeful and solving, makes it rewarding when you've succeeded. Um, stick to that idea. You know, you, you're not the only one suffering. Don't feel bad because you, you didn't put yourself in this situation. Um, we're all in it together. And if, if, you, if you aren't seeking help, that's probably the first problem you're going to want to tackle is building that network of people who can provide it. Um, you know, and, and, and beyond that, making prudent choices. So there's a, there's a difference between, you know, uh, optimism and being risk prone and being reckless. Um, make sure that you're not sticking to your business strategy or maybe to the business itself because of, you know, just an emotional motivation. Make sure that this really does make sense um, to go forward and your adaptations are going to make you better off um, because businesses should always serve your well-being. You know, your business is your mule not your baby. It's supposed to improve your life and improve the people who utilize those services and goods. Um, you know, not, not drag you down, not bleed you dry. Thanks, Sean. Um, I'd like to touch a little bit about on the um, industry of co-working spaces. So early on, um, the early years of co-working were often based on tech, high tech. Mm, they were hitchhiking on the increasing demand of IT services and the use of the internet. Um, and then in the beginning, co-working was simply defined as a physical space where independent and mobile workers come together to work in a casual environment. Since then, the co-working movement has grown to um, 2,000 organizations worldwide, and they've been adding features such as international collaboration, healthcare insurance, childcare, and there's even a co-working day on August 9th. So that's pretty amazing, the growth um, of co-working spaces. Uh, what do you think, what direction do you think co-working is going? Does it maybe even go corporate? Yeah, so it's interesting. You know, I, 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 uh, I think a lot of people see the, the story of co-working that way as, you know, it was primarily about accessing the internet and office space first. Um, and then it's sort of doing kind of these other interesting business things. And, and now it might be reaching kind of corporate prominence. But really, the, the co-working uh, is catalyzed out of uh, a desire for people to be together first and foremost. Um, and the space was, uh, you know, a, a, a secondary to that. You know, it just became something that they solved afterward. Um, and so, you know, adding things like childcare and healthcare. Um, adding international collaboration. Um, you know, we have re reciprocity agreements with co-working spaces in other cities so that our members can go visit them and theirs can come visit us. Adding all that stuff was just continuing on the philosophy we began with of um, accessibility. Everybody is welcome. Um, cooperation. We want to solve problems together. Uh, and we'll keep figuring out what the next problem is that, that we're going to solve. You know, the, 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 high, most, the most highly valued company at, at, that had ever existed, and, and certainly its value has decreased, um, now was we work a, a, a sensibly a co-working company. So co-working has gone corporate in the sense that large companies have tried to enter this space. But as I, I tell anybody who's interested in this, there's no money in co-working, right? This is a social entrepreneurial venture. Nobody gets, nobody gets rich on co-working. Um, co-working meets a, a community need and it does it in a, in a, profit, a profit, profitable way. Um, but what I'll be interested to see is not the rise of corporate co-working, like, you know, WeWork, which has really struggled, you know, to, to even find a, a self-sustainable uh, revenue model. But we're going to see people who work in corporate settings leave those corporate settings to join co-working environments, in part because corporations realize that, you know, they can hire workers anywhere now, not just where they have offices, in part because corporations just aren't going to be as interested in maintaining offices. Um, and because workers themselves are not going to be interested in returning to them when they realize that they have an option like a co-working space where they'll be equally, if not more, productive. So I think we'll see, you know, co-working as um, a type of um, found family um, and self-selection into a professional group rather than assignment into a professional group by your employer. I think we'll see that trend rise because it doesn't just make your work better. It makes your day-to-day -day life better. Thank you. I think that's a very interesting trend. Um, tells you something about the future of work that we are actually going through right now. So I'm excited to um, 
um, go along. And I've learned so much in the last couple of weeks working from home. So it is it is revolutionary. It's not always it's always interesting and it's sometimes challenging. So we are reaching the end of our conversation with um, Sean Ferdoko. He's a co-founder of Radius Co-work in Erie. Thank you so very much for taking the time today. Please tell us where can people find you and what is the best way to get in touch with you? Well, and the, joke the is, whole network, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the joke is you can find me on Twitter. I kind of watch tweet nonstop. <laughs> um, but you can find us at radiusco.work. Um, and you'll be able to email me, book a tour, reach out and ask questions about membership, but you'll see a lot of stories of our members, especially on our blog. You'll see a list of many of our members who have chosen to you know, share their stories of what they do um, on our website. Um, and if anybody is looking for a service provider, if you want to support the co-working community, uh, reach out to me and I'll be happy to introduce you to everyone in our space who does any service that you're looking for. And you'll be passing it on to the next generation of small businesses, freelancers, or remote workers in the city of Erie who are looking to make this their home and really reinvest in the community. Sean, a big thanks to you and a big thanks to all who are watching along at home. Uh, thank you for tuning in, either uh, the live broadcast on the Jefferson's Facebook page or a later broadcast uh, on our YouTube channel on our website. Uh, and of course, to find out more uh, information about upcoming and past Jefferson programs, as well as publications, uh, please do head over to our website at www.jeserie.org. And be sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Uh, for the Jefferson Educational Society, I'm Ben Spagan. And I'm Angela Beaumont. Be safe, be sound, and thanks for listening and learning with us today.